Okay, and we're on. Welcome back, everyone, to Grockets OGTV. This is the GMAT version where we go through the official guide to the test. We're doing the 12th edition to the guide to the test, which if you've been following the broadcast, you knew. If you didn't, I just told you, you do need a copy of the book in front of you as we go through every question in the book, at least all the ones that have answers. And um, my name's Jim Jacobson, like it says right there. Um, Last time, we were approaching the end of the critical reasoning section. Actually, I think we only have two broadcasts left on uh, critical reasoning. Last time, we finished off with question number 100 on page 516. So that's actually where we're going to pick up. Still page 516. Last one on that page. No, it's not the last one on that page. It's the last one entirely on that page anyway. Uh, question number 101. So as before, I will read the question out loud. Um, you should have it in front of you. Uh, we'll go through the answer choices, correct and incorrect, discussing what makes them right and or wrong, and uh, move forward that way. So number one, or 101, haha, <laughs> it's not number one. For a trade embargo against a particular country to succeed, a high degree of both international accord and ability to prevent goods from entering or leaving that country must be sustained. A total blockade of uh, Patria's ports is necessary to an embargo, but such an action would be likely to cause international discord over the embargo. If the, claim, the claims above, if true, most strongly support which of the following conclusions? So, um, you know, the support which of the following conclusions is an inference type question, and when they phrase it that way in particular, um, one of the things, I didn't mention this as a strategy before, so hey, something new on this broadcast aside from the question numbers. One of the things you can try is just reading the word therefore in front of each of the answer choices to see if that makes sense as a conclusion, as something that follows from what just came above. Again, there does need to be support for that conclusion. Um, in, you know, the, what's there needs to lead logically to it. Uh, but sometimes that actually helps fit it into your frame of mind a little bit better. So... Um, if that's true, therefore, the balance of opinion is likely to favor Patria in the event of a blockade. So um, there's nothing about balance of opinion in the passage about what people think about it. It does say that it's likely to cause international discord, but that doesn't, the balance of opinion means the majority of opinion, the balance, yeah, the, the, the balance is the, the larger amount basically and so there's not enough in the passage to say that most people or even a majority of countries or international opinion givers whatever whatever this uh, passage is imagining is going on in this imaginary world um, there's not enough support for the idea of the balance of opinion being against um, the blockade or in favor of patria so there's not support for that one um, and the right so um, can we say, therefore, as long as international opinion is unanimous, unanimously against Patria, a trade embargo is likely to succeed. Um, so while that may be true, the passage itself actually says that the, um, the blockade itself will cause international discord. Any amount of discord means that there is not un unanimous international opinion. Discord means um, disagreement. So the passage itself says that there will be disagreement, and so while it may be true that it would succeed as long as there is unanimous agreement, the passage already says that there won't be. So choice B um, tells us something that we already kind of suspected, but it's completely irrelevant because it's not going to happen. Can we say, therefore, this is choice C, a naval blockade of Patria's ports would ensure that no goods enter or leave Patria. Um, that would be the definition of a blockade. You know, you block the port so that nothing comes in or out. Um, and that repeats what's already in the passage. It says um, a total blockade of Patria's ports is necessary to an embargo. It's already in there. That's not a conclusion that we would draw. That's a restatement of evidence we already have. Although it's a little bit tricky because it does restate stuff that is in the passage. So if you... Uh, we're just kind of looking for things that were within the scope of the passage. Choice C might have been tempting. Uh, D, therefore, any trade embargo against Patria would be likely to fail at some time. So likely to fail. What are the conditions for failure? Um, well, we find out that the conditions for success, you know, it says for a, for a trade embargo to succeed, you need two things. You need 
high degree of concord, aka agreement, um, and the ability to prevent goods. And so the blockade is the latter. That's the ability to prevent goods. Um, and it, you know, a, it says a total blockade of Patriot's ports is necessary to an embargo, but such an action would be likely to cause international discord. Discord is the opposite of concord. So um, while they, while they, you know, for this trade embargo for, to be successful, they will be able to prevent the goods, but they will not have the high degree of concord. Um, Therefore, it, we can conclude that any trade embargo against Patria would be likely to fail at some time because they won't have the high degree of concord needed for, needed for success. The passage says they will have discord, and the passage says they need con concord, and so therefore we can conclude that it won't succeed. So choice D, well, clearly it's the right one, but let's look at E anyway. Uh, therefore, for a blockade of Patria's ports to be successful, international opinion must be unanimous. So this one uh, probably should have been a little bit tempting if we hadn't already seen D, because it does talk about how um, we need international opinion to be on the side of the blockade uh, or the embargo. However, having a high degree of concord is not the same as unanimity. Okay, Not everyone needs to agree, just most people need to agree. And the uh, international discord mentioned in the passage is already um, is already kind of factored into that. So um, choice E is good-ish, but it draw it goes too far in the conclusion that it draws because we only need a high degree of concord, not everyone agreeing. So choice E too far, too extreme, I guess. Not that unanimity is necessarily extreme, but in this particular case, it goes beyond the level that we need it to go. Choice D is our answer. So page 516 to 517, question number 102. This is a theocratic, theater critic talking. The play La Finestrina, now at Central Theater, was written in Italy in the 18th century. The director claims that this production is as similar to the original production as is possible in a modern theater. Although the actor who plays Harlequin in the Harlequin the Clown gives a performance very reminiscent of the 20th century American comedian Groucho Marx. Marx's comic style was very much within the comic acting tradition that had begun in 16th century Italy. The considerations given best serve as an argument that. Um, and that's a really, it's, that's a new way to <laughs> phrase the actual question. We haven't won, haven't had one say yet, the consideration given best serve as part of an argument that, but um, what this, this is actually basically saying something very similar. Um, the, it's another conclusion that can be drawn from the passage. Those are considerations and therefore we can infer that the conclusion is, um, and so the, what this is saying is, you know, which of the following is, when we talk about what an argument is, sorry for backtracking on my own sentences here, very often with inference questions or with boldface questions, the, the word argument is used as um, a synonym for conclusion. We've seen that before in our boldface passages. Um, and so this is another... Um, to read the, the uh, question another way, it could as easily say the evidence given best serve as part of a conclusion that. So the correct answer choice will be a conclusion that we can draw from the evidence that's there. And uh, so far, we know that uh, La Finestrina equals 18th century play, um, and the actor... Actor is similar to Groucho Marx in his performance, but that comes as part of a tradition that begins in the 16th century, which predates La Finestrina. So um, there's a connection here. There, the, basically, the argument is making a connection between the traditions of the play and the traditions of the role being played by the lead actor 
or the, the interpretation of that of the role of Harlequin the clown uh, being done by the lead, lead actor. Both of them stem from um, Italian theater traditions. Okay, so the conclusion will probably be something related to that. Uh, choice A, modern audiences would find it hard to tolerate certain characteristics of a historically accurate performance of an 18th century play. Probably true, cultural context is a big deal, but it's not a conclusion we can draw from the passage. All the author, um, all the author of the passage is saying is that, yeah, he's doing you know 20th century Groucho Marx, but that comes from a 16th century tradition. We aren't really saying anything about, um, um, you know, that uh, about what modern audiences would say. So to really, to some extent or really not even to some extent. Really, choice A is out of scope, but what modern audiences would think about it. Uh, choice B, Groucho Marx once performed the part of the character Harlequin in La Finestrina. Uh, that would be funny if it were true, um, but again, what Groucho Marx actually did is different. We're, we're talking about uh, theatrical traditions and how um, the play that, that, that in, in being performed at Central Theater is as close as possible to um, the original production, even though it's got a kind of anachronistic Groucho Marx-like character in it. Okay, choice C. In the United States, the training of actors in the 20th century is based on principles that do not differ radically from those that underlay... Hmm. I would have figured the word would be underlie. Anyway, not differ radically from those that underlay the training of actors in 18th century Italy. Actors training also outside the scope. We're talking about context, saying that this is that this production is as close as possible to the original, and even though there's a Groucho Marx-like character, that in turn is still part of this old tradition. Uh, choice D, the performance of the actor who plays Harlequin in La Finestrina does not serve as evidence against the director's claim. What director's claim is that? That it's as close as possible to the original play. And if the performance of Groucho Marx, a Grouch, if a Groucho Marx-like performance um, is coming from a, uh, a tradition that started in 18th century Italy, um, or excuse me, 16th century Italy, then it was presumably still alive in 18th century Italy, or at least familiar to people. Um, and therefore, that evidence is not a claim against the idea that it's as close as possible to the original. Basically, what they're saying is that because this Groucho Marx-like performance um, resembles ancient Italian performances, it's still as close as possible to the original. So choice D sounds really good. Again, it has this um, idea uh, of this, of part two, supporting part one. Let's check E, though. The director of La Finestrina must have advised the actor who plays Harlequin to model his performance on comic performances of Groucho Marx. Uh, no, it's not. I mean, you know, he may have. He or she may have um, told, the, told the actor to do that. But um, we don't have evidence to support that from the passage where we do have evidence to support a connection between the setting, uh, the original setting of the, or the original environment of the, the, the original context, the original cultural context of the play with the original cultural context of a Groucho Marx-like performance. So E is not it, choice D is it for number 102. On to page 517 and question number 103. The cost of producing radios in country Q is 10% less than the cost of producing radios in country Y. Even after transportation fees and tariff charges are added, it is still cheaper for a company to import radios from country Q to country Y than to produce radios in country Y. So we have Q and we have Y. Um, and the radios are 10% cheaper to produce in country Q. Um, after taxes, they're still cheaper. Taxes and tariffs. Okay, so that's what we have from the passage. It's 10%, uh, it costs 10% less to, uh, we'll put it as cost. Um, and then after taxes and tariffs, 
it's still cheaper. So uh, the statements above, if true, best support which of the following assertions. The assertions will probably relate to um, these costs since the entire passage is about the uh, cost of radios in Q versus Y. Uh, choice A, can, can this be used as support for labor costs in country Q are 10% below those in country Y? Well, we do know that the overall cost of production is 10% less, and in theory it's possible that that's all labor costs, but there's nothing in the passage to support the idea that it must be labor costs. It doesn't support the idea that it's labor costs as opposed to materials, uh, so choice A is too specific for our purposes. Choice B, can we um, assert that importing radios from country Q to country Y will eliminate 10% of the manufacturing jobs in country Y? I, I shouldn't laugh at the answer choices, but um, just because these are cheaper, that does not automatically translate to a specific 10% loss in manufacturing jobs, um, especially if country Y doesn't bother trying to make radios at all, and they just say, yeah, you know what, we'll just import from country Q, it's cheaper. Uh, then it wouldn't cost them any manufacturing jobs. So. Uh, B, totally outside the scope of the passage. Uh, choice C, the tariff on a radio imported from country Q to country Y is um, less than 10% of the cost of, the manu of manufacturing the radio in country Y. So what this is saying is that, so country Q's radios start out 10% uh, cheaper than country Y, even after you add, it's not actually taxes, I guess it's transportation fees and tariffs. Sorry for putting down the wrong thing, but it doesn't really matter. Even after tariffs are added, um, country Q's radios are still cheaper. Okay, um, It's still cheaper to import them with the transportation fees included. Um, if that's the case, the transportation fees and tariffs must be less than 10% of the cost of radios in country Y, because this 10% discount doesn't get entirely used up by uh, tariffs and transportation fees. If it doesn't entirely get used up, it must be less than 10%. So um, that's exactly what choice C is saying. It's basically saying that the amount that the price goes up still doesn't bring it to equal the cost of the radios in country Y, which we already knew. So choice C, clearly the winner. Um, let's look at the other ones, though. The fee for transporting a radio from country Q to country Y is more than 10% of the cost of manufacturing the radio in country Q. If that were true, actually I'm not even sure that that even matters because country Q's radios are 10% cheaper than country Y's. It doesn't, it's, I think it's potentially irrelevant whether it's 10% of the cost in country Q to transport because that also still ignores tariffs anyway. So I think choice D is another scope one. It, it just focuses in on this, um, it repeats 10%, all of these keep repeating 10% as if that's going to be the magic number, um, and then it goes directly to the transportation fee, um, and also being more than 10% of the cost, we have no way of knowing really. So choice E, it takes 10% less time to manufacture a radio in country Q than it does in country Y. Um, well there's that time issue, time being one of the specific ways that uh, they introduce out-of-scope uh, answer choices on the GMAT. Um, and there's no reason to, just as with A, just because it's 10% cheaper doesn't mean that it has to be labor or that it has to be time. It, it's certainly a 10% savings, and if time were directly correlated with money in the case of um, producing these radios, then perhaps we could infer E, but we don't have evidence for that, and that leaves time outside the scope. Still page 517, of course, because we really just got here. Question number 104. Although the discount stores in Goreville Central Shopping District are expected to close within five years as a result of competition from a spend-less discount department store that just opened, those locations will not stay vacant for long. In the five years since the opening of Colson's, a non-discount department store, a new store has opened at the location of every store in the shopping district that closed because it could not compete with Colson's. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument? So, remember weakening the argument often hinges on identifying the assumption. Uh, it doesn't have to in every case, um, but I think in this one it, it is going to be useful to identify the assumption. So the conclusion is that um, C 
spend less. Um, uh, spend less coming. Does not mean vacant stores. Their evidence for this is that Colson's coming did not mean vacant stores. What's missing connecting these two ideas? Um, basically, the assumption is that uh, Colson's works the same way as spend less, or that their situations are the same, or similar enough that you can use uh, Colson's as evidence at all, even though Colson's is a non-discount department store and spend less is a discount department store. So, um, which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument? We need to weaken the connection between the, we need to make the Colson's example less applicable to the case of the spend less coming. So we need to deny that there's a good connection between the two. Um, so choice A, many customers of Colson's are expected to do less shopping there than they did before the spend less store opened. So what customers do is kind of irrelevant. We are worried about the specific examples cited when each of these came to town, what happened. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, choice B, it's not A, choice B. Increasingly, the stores that have opened in the central job, uh, huh. increasingly, the stores that have opened in the central shopping district since Colson's opened have been discount stores. What does this mean? So Colson's equals non-discount. So when Colson's came into town, a bunch of stores went out of business, um, and then they were replaced, those storefronts were replaced with discount uh, department stores, things that were not in direct competition with Colson's, okay? Um, so if spend less comes to town, which is already a discount department store, if we use um, Colson's as an example, um, or even if we don't, if it dry and it says um, discount stores in Goreville's central shopping district are expected to close within five years as a result of competition from a spend less. Okay, so um, so so we are we, we're weakening the applicability of the Colson's. Um, okay, let me start over. The conclusion was that spend less coming does not mean vacant stores. Uh, because Colson's coming did not mean vacant stores, but if we highlight the fact that the stores that came in as a replacement were not actually even things in competition with it, and that if spend less is coming to town and it's going to knock out its, com its competing stores, we don't have yet another type of department store to go in in place of either non-discount or discount department stores. So um, their argument was that um, Stores came back even after Colson's came to town. The to weaken it, we say, well, yes, yeah, stores came back, but they weren't the same type of stores. So um, Colson's is clearly a different market than Spend Less, and that highlighting that aspect and highlighting how different stores came back, that ones that still couldn't compete with Colson's, those also will not be able to compete with spend less and now with these two dominant chains in place in the market oh sorry central shopping district it's not necessarily as clear that the empty stores will be filled by something else because we have these two things that knock out competition so choice B actually looks pretty good we can move on to check the other ones uh, choice C at present the central shopping district has as many stores operating in it as it ever had. Um, that's kind of irrelevant actually. <laughs> um, not really too much we can say about that, about the number of stores. Uh, choice D, over the course of the next five years it is expected that Goreville's population will grow at a faster rate than it has for the past several decades. So that 
the impact of that would be the same whether spend less um, was similar to um, Goreville or not. A uh, growing population is, has kind of an equal effect on any situation. So it's not D. It doesn't weaken the connection also between the evidence of the Colsons coming to town and the spend less coming to town, just saying that the population went out. So to some extent, it's also scope. Choice E, many stores in the central shopping district sell types of merchandise that are not available at either Spend Less or Colson's. Uh, type of merchandise, again, that's uh, creating a distinction that isn't necessarily an issue. Uh, again, trying to change the focus of the argument, uh, shifting out of the scope of what we actually have. So choice B is our correct one for 104. Last one on 517, number 105. The average normal infant born in the United States weighs between 12 and 14 pounds at the age of three months. Therefore, if a three-month-old child weighs only 10 pounds, its weight gain has been below the United States average. So, um, this is another one susceptible to our equation. The conclusion is um, three month old, 10 pounds uh, below average weight gain. And the evidence is that three month old average weight equals 12 to 14 pounds. So this is one of those ones where we, where we look for phrases in the conclusion that didn't appear in the evidence, and the, the one that jumps out is weight gain. So just because it's below average weight doesn't mean it um, had below average weight gain. So if a newborn is born underweight, but gains weight at the same rate as children born at whatever the normal rate weight is, um, it could have the exact same average weight gain but and would therefore still be at a lower total weight because it started at a lower initial number. So um, weight, the assumption is that weight equals weight gain or that they are, that to have one below the average means you have the other below the average and that simply isn't true. So um, which of the following indicates a flaw in the reasoning above? Uh, we would want to say that weight and weight gain are not the same thing because they're totally not. Um, choice A, weight is only one measure of normal infant development. Totally true, but that's not a flaw in the reasoning. Uh, choice B, some three-month-old children weigh as much as 17 pounds. Probably also true. Uh, also definitely not a flaw in the reasoning. Choice C, it is possible for a normal child to weigh 10 pounds at birth. Um, Sure, I think so. I mean, I don't know that much about babies, but that sounds likely, but it's still not addressing our weight versus weight gain issue. Choice D, the phrase below average does not necessarily mean insufficient. Also true, also not addressing our specific issue. And then choice E, average weight gain is not the same as average weight. Well, that's exactly what we predicted, so it's totally choice E. Um, this is a, a great one because a lot of people know stuff about babies <laughs> um, for obvious reasons because you know there's a lot of those things lying around. Um, you know this is one where outside knowledge could make these wrong answer choices very tempting because you know if you know something if you have children um, or if you have uh, family members or friends who have children and you've been involved in that process you may know a lot about the weight of babies and how all of these things may be true um, that could make them more attractive and could make this a challenging question. However, only one specifically deals with the assumption of the argument, and that is choice E. And that is our cue to turn the page to 518. Question number 106. Kale has more nutritional value than spinach, but since collard greens have more nutritional value than lettuce, it follows that kale has more nutritional value than lettuce. Any of the following, if introduced into the argument as an additional premise, make the argument above logically correct except. All right, so we know that um, kale has more nutritional value than spinach. And we also know that collard greens, we'll just use C, have more nutritional value than lettuce. 
and we need to get to the point that kale has more nutritional value than lettuce. And we don't really have a clear way of getting to that from our answer choices. So we need to basically um, logically connect um, statement 1 to statement 2 such that k is greater than l. And there's a variety of ways we can do that. Obviously, four of the five answer choices are going to do exactly that. Let's see what we get. So choice A, collard greens have more nutritional value than kale. So that gives us C is greater than K and C is greater than L. But we don't have enough about the relative values of, of K and L, whether K is in fact greater than L. Remember, that's the one we're actually trying to establish logically. And we also know that K is greater than S. But because we don't know where lettuce fits, into our uh, scheme here. Actually, choice A is looking pretty good. I don't see a logical connection. Let's check the other ones. It should be a clear logical connection between kale and lettuce. Uh, choice B gives us spinach has more nutritional value than lettuce. So that gives us K is greater than S, which we had already, but now we know that spinach is greater than lettuce. Therefore, K is greater than L, and that's not our right answer. Uh, choice B, spinach has, oh, I already did that one. Choice C, um, spinach has more nutritional value than collard greens. So that gives us K is greater than S is greater than collard greens, and that in turn is greater than lettuce. So still, K is greater than L, logically. Uh, choice D, spinach and collard greens have the same nutritional value. Spinach and collard greens, so K is still greater, kale is greater than spinach, but that equals collard greens, which is still greater than lettuce. So K is still greater than L. It's not D. And then E, kale and collard greens have the same nutritional, val same nutritional value. So we have kale um, and collard greens have the same nutritional value, therefore K is, wow, this is going to be tricky to write out here, k is greater than s and k is greater than l, and that also means that c is greater than s and c is greater than l. But either way, we still have the key element that we needed, namely k is greater than l, or kale is greater than lettuce. And so choice E also gives us a clear logical connection, an additional premise that would give us uh, kale's nutritional uh, value is greater than lettuce. Only choice A um, it does not clearly establish the hierarchy of kale and lettuce. And so we move on. This is an unusual question. Um, this is much closer to what you might get to the type of reasoning on LSAT and stuff like that. Um, luckily, this type is not super common, but you do need to be prepared for doing some kind of abstract figuring. I pers I mean, some people can probably do this one in their head. I have to write all the stuff down to, to see it. So uh, <laughs> what I've written down here was not just for your benefit. This is what I would have done on the real GMAT, too. I don't know if I would have written down all of these things. I, you know, I could have looked at it from this information and figured it out. But um, don't, don't make the mistake of trying to do too much in your head. It can often just end up taking way more time than just taking the time to write down a couple notes. Page 518, question number 107. Last year, all refuse collected by Shelbyville City Services was incinerated. These, this incineration generated a large quantity of residual ash. In order to reduce the amount of residual ash Shelbyville generates this year to half of last year's total, the city has revamped its collection program. This year, city services will separate for recycling enough refuse to reduce the number of truckloads of refuse to be incinerated to half of last year's number. So, which of the following is required for the revamped collection program to achieve its aim? Um, right. So the goal um, is to produce half the ash. The plan is to reduce half the number of truckloads. So um, 
basically, um, so which of the following is required for the revamped collection program to achieve its aim? Uh, basically, for this to, um, to, to be successful, um, to cut this in half by cutting this in half, this uh, correlation, the, the, the proportion between the two needs to stay constant. So the rate of ash produced by, but for e by each truckload needs to stay true. Um, right? I mean, that, that's in order, in order for, for, I mean, in theory, um, so I guess things that could weaken it or things that we need to be required Maybe all the truckloads need to produce the same amount of ash, I mean, or that the average amount per truckload needs to stay the same um, as it did last year. If they, if they suddenly start collecting things that generate more ash per truckload, things that are just ashier, I don't, I don't really know that much about incinerating things, but you're not supposed to for the purposes of critical reasoning passages. Um, if, but uh, in, order, in order to meet their plan, they need to not produce any more ash per truckload. If, if that's the case, then half the truckloads will produce half the ash. Let's look for something like that in the answer choices. So A, this year no materials that city services could separate for, recycli for recycling will be incinerated. Um, so they actually could still incinerate stuff that could have been recycled as long as they have half the truckloads and half the ash, then their plan is still successful. Uh, choice B, separating recyclable materials from materials to be incinerated will cost Shelbyville less than half what it cost last year to dispose of the residual ash. Good news for them, but that's kind of the money trap there. Um, it's not required for it to cost less because the goal is just ash production with half the truckloads. Um, C, refuse collected by city services will contain a larger proportion of recyclable materials this year than it did last year. Um, this increases the chances of their being able to separate out half the trash to be recycled, but it sounds like they already were going to be able to do that anyway, regardless of whether the proportion went up. So uh, choice C doesn't need to happen, they just need to be able to get rid of half, and the proportion doesn't have to go up for that to happen. Uh, choice D, the refuse incinerated this year will generate no more residual ash per truckload incinerated than did the refuse incinerated last year. Okay, so that sounds about right. If all of a sudden they start transporting ashier stuff to the, um, to the incinerator, they may still produce more than half the ash that they did the previous year. So choice D sounds like what we were after. Uh, choice E, the total quantity of refuse collected by Shelbyville City Services this year will be no greater than that collected last year. So this one uh, is actually kind of tempting, um, but um, so even if they still collect the same, even if they uh, collect more refuse um, by separating out the things for recycling, as long as they still have half the truckloads, so even if they're collecting more, if they have half the truckloads that they had last year um, and produce half the ash, they've still met their goals. So um, choice E, if they collected more, more refuse to the point where they had far more truckloads of, or, or more, if they had more truckloads of stuff and that reduced that, that uh, ended up in their producing more than half the ash that they had produced last year, then their plan would fail. But there's a couple steps that we have to add to answer choice E to be a requirement for their plan to succeed. So choice E comes close, but there's not enough information in it to make it a requirement of the plan. So choice D it is. 518 number 108. Although custom prosthetic bone replacements produced through a new computer-aided design process will cost more than twice as much as ordinary replacements, custom replacements should still be cost-effective. Not only will surgery and recovery time be reduced, but custom replacements should last longer, thereby reducing the need for further hospital stays. Which of the following must be studied in order to evaluate the argument presented above? Okay, so um, the argument is new... Um, is more cost effective. 
That's their argument. These new custom prosthetic bone replacements are better than the old ones. They're, they're, they're more cost effective, even though they cost twice as much. So, in order to, what the, this is another one of those, you know, which of the following, which, which of the following questions must be answered? We've had a few like that. What we're really looking for is, is something that, depending on what the answer is, it could actually weaken their conclusion. So, we need to attack the cost effectiveness of the um, new bone replacements. So, the correct answer choice will be one that, depending on the results of the study, they may not actually cost somebody less, and in fact would cost somebody more uh, in total, including both the cost of the things themselves and all these other things that they talk about, uh, recovery time, uh, surgery, redu uh, further hospital stays. Okay, So, cost. Here we come, cost. We're looking for you. Um, answer choice A, the amount of time a patient spends in surgery versus the amount of time spent recovering from surgery. This is one of those false distinctions. Um, all of those things fall under the category of costs associated with bone replacements. Um, and since we don't know that one or the other costs more, knowing that um, which thing the patient spends more time on um, doesn't give us any new information. So false distinctions like that are questions of scope. It's too narrow. Uh, choice B, the amount by which the cost of producing custom replacements has declined with the introduction of the new technique for producing them. So this is um, a question that talks about the old way of producing the new replacements versus the new way of producing the new replacements. And we don't care at all about that. Um, we care about the new replacements versus the old, old replacements. The, um, so just because costs are going down, um, we don't need to determine whether the costs are going down in the manufacturing process. What we care about is whether the holistic approach of using these twice as expensive computer-aided design bone prostheses is cheaper um, or is cost-effective compared to the old procedure. So this one, choice B compares one version of the new ones to, to another version of the new ones. We care about the new ones compared to the old ones. Choice C, the degree to which the use of custom replacements is likely to reduce the need for repeat surgery when compared with the use of ordinary replacements. So here we're comparing the new versus old. And it talks about the likelihood for uh, reducing the need for, reduce, for um, repeat surgery. Repeat surgery introduces all the other costs that are mentioned above. Uh, surgery, recovery time, um, and the, and the hospital stays. So all those things come with coming back for more surgery or, or getting new new replacements. Um, so how long they last basically um, is actually an element in whether they're more cost-effective compared to the old um, the old replacements. So choice C looks pretty good. Let's keep looking though. Um, D, the degree to which custom replacements produced with the new technique are more carefully manufactured than our ordinary replacements. Care, not a factor, outside the scope. We'd hope that they'd be careful, but um, not for the purposes of this argument. Uh, choice E, the amount by which custom replacements produced with the new technique will drop in cost as the production procedures become standardized and applicable on a larger scale. So the argument is that uh, the new replacements, the computer-aided design, twice as expensive, new bone prosthe prostheses, um, the argument is already that they're cost-effective. Um, and, and we just need to look at basically something else that might make them not cost-effective. Determining the amount by which the costs go down as more people make them and they get better at making them, while relevant to the industry, is not relevant to the issue of whether the way they exist right now is more cost effective than the ordinary replacements. Whoops, did I do that? I guess I did. Sorry about that. Um, oh, I should erase it actually. Okay, um, so choice E is also outside the scope. This is more sort of long term. What we're talking about is right now are the new replacements cost effective despite being twice as expensive to buy the darn things. So choice E is not it, and choice C is. It compares the new versus the old versus choice E, which is 
new versus new again. And it specifically addresses the things that could make it cost more. Choice C does. Still page 518. Uh, number 109. Springfield Fire Commissioner says, the vast majority of false fire alarms are prank calls made anonymously from fire alarm boxes on street corners. Since virtually everyone has access to a private phone, these alarm boxes have outlived their usefulness. Therefore, we propose to remove the boxes. Removing the boxes will reduce the number of prank calls without hampering people's ability to report a fire. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the claim that the proposal, if carried out, will have the announced effect? The announced effect is reduced prank calls um, same real fire calls. Okay, so in order to support that, we need to either reduce pranks, have the same, same effect on making real fire calls, or both. Choice A, the fire department traces all alarm calls made from private telephones and records where they came from. So um, recording where they came from could certainly reduce pranks, also, on the, uh, this may be uh, too much of an assumption, but if the uh, fire alarm boxes on street corners are wired in such that the fire department knew where those alarms, well, they must have know, known where those were coming from because it's just an alarm that people pull. So they knew where, which alarm was where. Um, so that makes it, uh, if they're able to trace phone calls as opposed to just pulling a fire alarm that says ding, 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 corner of this street and this street, um, Tracing the location of real fire calls is just as effective with uh, private phones if it's true that they can trace all the alarm calls made. So choice A really addresses both points, but let's look at the others. Choice B, maintaining the fire alarm boxes costs Springfield approximately $5 million annually. There's your money trap right there. Um, a telephone call can provide, and then see now, a telephone call can provide the fire department with more information about the nature and size of a fire than can an alarm placed from an alarm box. While true, it doesn't actually address either of these two points, that it reduces uh, pranks or is just as easy and effective as um, uh, it doesn't hamper people's ability to report a fire. If, if, if they, you know, in theory, they could have a device that gives precise GPS data on the size and location of the fire, but if it was really hard for people to use, um, it wouldn't meet the goals stated by the passage. Choice D, responding to, fire, to false alarms significantly reduces the fire department's capacity for responding to fires. True, but that doesn't reduce pranks or not hamper people's ability to make real calls. Uh, and E, on any given day, a significant percentage of the public telephones in Springfield are out of service. Public telephones totally outside the scope. So, choice A um, gives us a reason that uh, people are not hampered and are and can make calls just as, make fire calls just as effectively, and that pranks would be reduced. Page five nineteen, number one ten. Currently, measuring the productivity of service workers is complex. Consider, for example, postal workers. They are often said to be more productive if more letters are delivered per postal worker. But is this really true? What if more letters are lost or delayed per worker at the same time that more are delivered? The objection implied above to the productivity measure described is based on doubts about the truth of which of the following statements. Wow. Okay. So that answer, um, or the question itself, is worded in a kind of a complicated way. What it's asking is... Um, the passage is an objection to which of the answer choices. That's what it's saying. So um, whatever, whatever the, the correct answer choice will be a blanket statement that uh, the passage will provide a good objection to. Namely, that just um, the, the, number, the, the amount of stuff being done is not all there is to productivity. That's what the objection is. So let's, let's look for something relevant in the answer choices. Choice A, postal workers are representative of service workers in general. That does not fit. Um, 
So a good way to think about this is if you're having trouble processing this, imagine that the answer choice is the first sentence and then you have the word but and then you read the passage. So the passage should be something that contrasts the statement in the um, answer choice. So postal workers are representative of service workers in general. But correctly measuring the productivity of service workers is complex. Consider, for example, postal workers, not hardly. Uh, B, the delivery of letters is the primary activity of the postal service. I don't think we even need to read that one in. That's, uh, the passage is not at all about the primary activity of postal workers. Uh, C, productivity should be ascribed to categories of workers, not to individuals. Um, individuals versus categories of workers uh, doesn't seem to be an issue. We're really just talking about service workers anyway. So C, I'm not even going to read that one in. Uh, D, the quality of services rendered can, be appropri can appropriately be ignored in computing productivity. So if we read this one in, we might even start it off with, some say the quality of services rendered can be appropriately ignored in computing productivity. But correctly measuring the productivity of service workers is complex. Consider, for example, this example. So choice D looks pretty good as a general statement that the passage contradicts by saying, look, it's not just about the quality. It's not just about uh, quantity of service. It is also about quality. Whereas choice D says, no, 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 it's all about quantity when you're measuring productivity. Finally, E, the number of letters delivered is relevant to measuring the productivity of postal workers. So this is not something that the passage would necessarily object to because, I mean, the passage does, I mean, uh, amount of stuff that you put out is part of productivity. It, it acknowledges that productivity is complex and it's not just about quantity. So uh, choice E is not something that the passage would actually be um, an objection to because it, it, it continues to say that it's relevant to measuring the productivity of postal workers. It's just not the only factor. So it's not E, it's choice D. Last one on 519, number 111. The difficulty with the proposed high-speed train line is that a used plane can be bought for one-third the price of the train line, and the plane, which is just as fast, can fly anywhere. The train would, would be a fixed linear system, and we live in a world that is spreading out in all directions and in which consumers can choose the freewheel systems, cars, buses, aircraft, which do not have fixed routes. Thus, a sufficient market for the train will not exist. Which of the following, if true, most severely weakens the argument presented above? Okay, so the argument presented above is that... Um, Basically, uh, we're, we're, talk we're comparing the cost effectiveness, really, and the utility of planes versus trains. Um, and the argument is that trains are on a linear system and that aircraft are on this free, free wheel system that um, can go anywhere and are also cheaper. So we need to weaken this argument that planes are greater than trains because they are freewheel where trains are linear and also that they're one-third the price. That's another part of the argument why planes are greater than trains. Uh, so A, cars, buses, and planes require the efforts of drivers and pilots to guide them, whereas the trains will be guided mechanically. Uh, so choice A is actually telling us what we already knew. That's, tel that's telling us that um, they are freewheel systems and trains are linear. That doesn't weaken the connection. Uh, you, could, you could make those as arguments, uh, perhaps as part of costs or some other things, um, but that's not, what, that's not the scope of the argument. Uh, B, cars and buses are not nearly as fast as the high-speed train will be. Well, the point was that planes were just as fast, so just because cars and buses can't keep up, that's not a factor. Uh, C, planes are not a freewheel system because they can fly only between airports, which are less convenient for consumers than the high-speed train stations would be. So this actually effectively eliminates this free wheel advantage and in fact makes them more restricted or less convenient than trains would be. So all, that's, all that they have left is the price. This does pretty severely weaken the argument, but let's look at the other ones. Uh, D, the high-speed train line cannot use currently underutilized train stations in large cities. True, but outside the scope um, and doesn't address the issue of planes having this go anywhere advantage. 
And then E for long trips, most people prefer to fly rather than to take ground level transportation. Personal preference, not a factor. Again, we're just talking about the ability to go anywhere versus being on a linear system. So choice E, or excuse me, E is wrong, C is correct. All right, last one on the next page. Page 520, question number 112. The average hourly wage of television assemblers in Vernland has long been significantly lower than that in neighboring Borodia. Since Barodia dropped all tariffs on Vernlandian televisions three years ago, the number of televisions sold annually in Barodia has not changed. However, recent statistics show a drop in the number of television assemblers in Barodia. Therefore, updated trade statistics will probably indicate that the number of televisions Barodia imports annually from Vernland has increased. Which of the following is an assumption on which the argument depends? Okay, so we have Vernland and Barodia. First of all, first off, we have the cheaper wage. That's the first thing we find out about. Um, and then we find out that uh, Barodia dropped tariffs. And then we show um, in Barodia fewer, I can spell really, fewer assemblers. And the conclusion then is that um, more TVs will be going from Vernland to Barodia because they have a cheaper wage and even in spite of that with dropped tariffs the number of TVs sold in Barodia has remained unchanged. And with fewer assemblers um, the, con the argu argument has the conclusion that therefore they must be producing fewer TVs because that means that if they have fewer assemblers, if they have fewer people making domestic televisions, they are going to have to import more of ones that are apparently cheaper. That, that, and so the assumption in this argument um, ties fewer assemblers to the number of TVs that they're producing. And so that's that's the assumption. Let's look for something like that in the answer choices. A, the number of television assemblers in Vernland has increased by at least as much as the number of television assemblers in Barodia has decreased. So uh, Vernland does not have to increase its television assemblers in order for the balance of trade to kind of tip so that more TVs are going to Barodia. All we need is fewer on one side and more TVs should go from left to right in our diagram. So. Choice A is not an assumption that we need to have. Choice B, televisions assembled in Vernland have features that televisions assembled in Barodia do not have. Completely outside the scope, the features of the television are not relevant. We really only care about the assemblers and imports, basically. Uh, C, the average number of hours it takes a Barodian television assembler to assemble a television has not decreased significantly during the past three years. Most people, when they get this one, they completely uh, pass over this as, a, as an answer, but actually this is the right one. Um, the argument uses fewer assemblers, fewer TV assemblers, as the reason for saying that they're producing fewer of them. If each assembler can produce, can assemble more TVs um, in the same amount of time, they can have the exact same uh, television production with fewer assemblers, which would mean that more TVs would not necessarily be going from Vernland to Barodia because they'd be producing the same amount. Again, fewer assemblers was taken to mean that they were producing fewer, but if they're producing more per assembler, their, their rate could be the same or even be higher. So choice C is actually our tempting, actually it's the right answer, I'll just give it away, but let's look at the other answer choices. Uh, D, the number of televisions assembled annually in Vernland has increased significantly during the past three years. Whether this, whether Vernland ha is assembling more doesn't affect how many go in this direction. It depends on how many Barodia is producing on its own. So it's not D. And then E, the difference between the hourly wage of television assemblers in Vernland and the hourly wage of television assemblers in Barodia is likely to decrease in the next few years. There's nothing about their relative wages, so we, we, that's, not, that's totally outside the scope of the passage. We are, we're not making predictions about what, what's likely to happen to wages in the future. 
only to TVs imported uh, into Barodia from Vernland. So choice C, fewer assemblers does not mean fewer TVs, is our answer. And that is going to be a good place to stop. My name's Jim Jacobson. Like it says there, you've been watching Grocket.com's OGTV. Next time, I think we actually finish off, I think we finish off Critical Reasoning next time. So uh, if you want to be there for the triumphant conclusion, maybe I'll, you know, draw some fireworks and colors next time. Um, that those are in black and white, just as kind of a teaser of how exciting it's going to be. And um, tune in next time, and I hope to see you there.